Welcome to this lecture on encountering the Triune God. Now, often when we uh, talk about the Trinity, it seems to be such a complex and difficult thing and all kinds of rash rational arguments. I give my uh, students a, an assignment to work as a play where they got to interview some Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, talk to them as Christians. Now, uh, it's interesting that the issue is always about, is Jesus really God? And then it seems like they're playing a little bit of text tennis with these other students who play the role of Jehovah's Witnesses to try and up the issue the whole time, making the net a little bit higher to see if we can catch out the other guy's text ball that comes back to them. But in the process, it is all very dry, very boring, all very rational, all decisions about is Jesus really God? Now, against that, I want to argue that the Trinity should operate in the context of worship. If your students, instead of trying to rationally outdo the Jehovah's Witnesses with some more text than they have, if they have actually come and say, wow, isn't God wonderful? Isn't God great? It, we're worshipping a God who didn't just send off a, a secondary God or his son as some kind of father with abusing his child to go and do the dirty work and go and die on the cross. But we're talking about a God who is invested in our salvation. And isn't he amazing that he's this abundant God of love? If that happens, if they are talking out of a context of being gripped and excited about this God who gives himself for the sins of the world, for our salvation, then that makes a massive difference to the way we engage with people like the Jehovah's Witnesses. So it's true that when we talk about the Trinity, we are talking about an issue of our salvation. We're talking about Jesus and, and about Christ. But the debate has for a long time been about, is Christ really God? And the problem is that if we debate that, we start off with a kind of a presupposition, an argument about what God is like. And we've got our pre-understanding. But our understanding of God needs to be shaped by God's revelation of himself in Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God. And so the whole question that we actually have before us is not in what way is Jesus God, but we need to ask ourselves in what way is God Christ? In what way is God reflected in Jesus? In what way is Jesus the criticism of all our presuppositions concerning who, what God is like? Because we often hold this view of a transcendent God that is beyond us and he's in the heavenly sphere. He comes down to earth. We talk about the incarnation that Jesus came to earth to come and die for our sins, but then we quickly go to the place that he rose from the dead and he is entered to the right hand side of God on his throne and we see this imminence is coming to earth was just a temporary the big action is actually in the heavenly realm where God is and then often we have this vision of God that is marked by all kinds of different characteristics or attributes that he is uh, unaffected by what happens outside of himself that is omnipresent is everywhere he is all-knowing he is unchanging he is the eternal ruler He's infinite. He's got no boundaries. And we all got all these different ideas about God, including other things like he's righteous, he's loving, he's caring. But there are all sort of ideas about God that we have in our heads and that somehow we're going to see how does Jesus then fit into this. The big idea is this, this is the transcendent God in the heavenly realm. And it's all about the spiritual reality. And so the church is there and its focus is upon how has Jesus restored us to God, the, the powerful God, our Father. In a sense, focus then more on the, the fact that Jesus is resurrected, that he is the Lord in glory. And I would suggest that this idea of 
wanting to connect with God in his transcendent holiness in heaven belongs to the religious human that wants to transcend who we are as humans and focus on God above. In that sense, we can say that God, uni uh, Christ came to unite us with this God, and in, to some extent, that He is the uh, that He is the means to help us be restored to God. Now, against this idea, I want to suggest that in, while we are radically Christologically focused, we need to take one step back and start with the Holy Spirit, with pneumatology. Now, the, the big question that the church wrestled with in the beginning, culminating in Nicaea 325, was the question, is Jesus God? And the, the idea of the Spirit only came in much later in the church, uh, church's discussions. 381, where the Spirit, sort of an add-on to the dimension of the Trinity. Not that it wasn't there, but the focus on the, the work of the Spirit. I think we need to turn that around. And we should start off with pneumatology, with the Spirit of God, in order for us to understand Christology and, and out of that our theology, our doctrine of God the Father, or ultimately what we want to say, doctrine of the triune God in His glory. Now, we're starting with, in starting with pneumatology, we got to say that Christ was who he was because he was the bearer of the Spirit, or that he was born by the Spirit. Von Ruler, the Dutch theologian, said Christ was posited by the Spirit. He was born of the Spirit. He received the Spirit visibly, outwardly, at his baptism for his ministry. He operated in the power of the Spirit. We read that, that Jesus... Um, drove our demons through the Spirit. We have this whole thing about the fact that Jesus said, if I do this by the power of the Spirit, then God's kingdom has come upon you. But And he warned them that if they call the work of the Spirit in with and through him as the work of the devil, that they're actually blaspheming the very essence, the very being of who God is. And then we also know that Jesus was raised from the dead by the Spirit, Romans 1. So the question then is, how do we understand the Spirit? What is the Spirit? Who is the Spirit? Now for this, we need to go back to a statement that Barth starts when he opens his uh, Doctrine of God. And he starts with a statement, God is. He's going to develop this. But he, it says God exists, that he is. But when Barth says that God is, he means by is more than the fact that God just exists like a corpse. But he says is is an event. He equates that is, God is, to God is alive. He is alive. He is the living God. That we find right throughout Scripture. So God exists as the living God. That is, is that God is alive. And as the living God, he is the God that has a conscious subject. He is not an infinite spirit, like a bound a spirit without any boundaries that just keeps on expanding and it's just a spiritual soup. But he is a living Lord that comes together to say, I, he exists as one who is a conscious subject, an I. We see that in the name that God says that he is, I am who I am. He is a person that speaks. So his name of Yahweh designates that he is this living Lord uh, that is personal. Now I'd like to move from that to the idea to say that God is, where Barth went and then he went to his alive and his love and different things, I first want to go to the idea that God is God. Barth himself says, shouldn't go there because that's a tautology. You're, just, you're not adding anything. You're just saying, putting God on both sides of the equation. 
But by saying that, I want to say God is God. I'm going to say God is alive as God. But in order to escape the idea that we are just repeating the same thing about God on both sides of the is, God is God, God has got to be slightly uh, differentiated in how is God on this side of the is and on the other side of the is. And what I want to suggest that God lives as the God of love, and to love means that God exists within himself in a relationship. One who just is without any relations, any relationship, how can we talk about love always presupposes a relationship. So this loving relationship is between God is God that is then as loves. God loves God. Now, how does that work? What do we mean by that? If we say God is God, means that both sides of God is not identical to each other. God's spirit, his subjectivity, who he is as God, differentiates within himself without any separation. So God differentiates within God, but does not separate God into different gods. What do we mean by that? Let's make it a bit more concrete. What we say is that God loves within himself that which is different within himself. So we read in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So there's a differentiation. God and the Word, and yet there's a unity because the Word was God. So God loved, the Father loved the Word, loved the Father, or they're bound in this way together. When we ask now in more detail in what way is God different within himself without forming two totally different subjects, we've got to say that the two dimensions, or if you want to call persons within God or subject subjective dimensions of God are complementary in the sense that they are different, separated, but they form one life, one spiritual identity, one ultimate I. God speaks as with one voice, as one God. He is not, he doesn't have the son speak this way and the father speaks another way. Now, to take this a little bit further, this differentiation means that God can actually seemingly hold two contradictory elements together within his being through the, the word and. So, in our logic, you have things that are contradictory. We designate them by or. You are powerful or you are weak. When it comes to God, we've got to say that God is all-powerful and vulnerable or weak. God is infinite without boundaries, and yet he's personal with personal subjectivity. God is all-knowing, but he can forget, for instance, our past sins. God is righteous that he stands against all that is evil, and he is gracious. The father is sovereign, he is the ruler, and yet the son is servant. So God is both ruler and servant together at the same time. So the other one is God is immortal, he cannot die, and yet in the son can die on the cross. So we've got these seemingly contradictory elements bound together within the being of God. Now these contradictions in the characteristics of God can only be overcome if we have a kind of what we call middle term or something else that they express. Otherwise we're going to talk nonsense to say God is all-powerful and is weak because those two exclude each other. But if both, both are dimensions or expressions of something bigger than themselves, then it makes uh, sense. And so we've got to go back to say that the very essence, the very being 
of God that these things express is the fact that God is love. It's only in as much as God's characteristics express his character, his subjectivity, his spirit as love that they complement rather than contradict each other. So that's the amazing thing. God is the God of love. And depending on the situation, God expresses his love in power and majesty, or he can express his love in vulnerability, weakness, suffering, even to the point of dying. Uh, so what we are saying that the two differentiated dimensions of God are united in one spirit of love, the Holy Spirit, by which the Father and Son are focused in love away from themselves onto the other, uh, that which they are not in and of themselves or the, that they don't doesn't that which doesn't express who God is in his being as the transcendent one or as the imminent one, the one that it comes close to each other. So it means that the father is directed at the son. He's focused, he loves who he is in the son. God loves who he is in the son, loves the father. He loves who he is in the father just as much as the Father loves who he is in the Son. So there's this focus of the unifying focus in love. We call that the perichoretic unity where they are bound together. So the differentiated dimensions or person of God find their final identity in love in the other. The Father identifies with who he is in the Son, the Son identifies with who he is in the Father. That means that God the Father participates in Christ through the Spirit, and Christ participates in God the Father through the Spirit. Father and Son share the same Spirit. So the whole of God is involved in love in our salvation. The Father is not distant and the Son doing things for him, but he's radically involved. A good ex example of this is this idea that the Church has always confessed that Jesus is both God and human. And that seems to be a contradiction. How can you be God and human at the same time? It's either or. Now, we know that Jesus is God who becomes human, and the, what we have here is a the same element through the Spirit, Jesus becomes human. There's differentiation, but not separation. We can, Jesus is different, differentiated as God and human, but they are not two separate entities. There's not a human Jesus that's separated from the divine Jesus. They are intrinsically bound together in one Spirit. As the human, Jesus is focused on his divinity, in his divinity, Jesus is focused on his humanity. He's bound in that one subjective eye, one spirit, again, that can be both God and human without two radically separatable, separable, the right word, entities or subjects. They form one subject within God because there's only one spirit in Jesus. When we think about God, in his creation, God did create that which he is not. So in that sense, in creation, we find a, an act of love. God creates out of the abundance of his love, but he creates that which he is not. He separates his creation from himself. His creation is not divine. Within the being of God, the Son emanates out of the God as an expression of who God is as love, and he is fully divine. But when God creates, he creates that which is not himself. They, humans, man and uh, woman, male and female, together give a reflection of what God is like without being divine in and of themselves. Uh, so there is this connection the, the Holy Spirit unites humanity with God in Christ. 
when uh, God becomes human. So God becomes the human through the Holy Spirit and the work of the Spirit in Jesus becoming human is to actually unite humanity and bind humanity together to God in this relationship of love that nothing can separate. Jesus is the God-man. You cannot pull that apart. Humanity is bound to divinity in Christ. No, not in ourselves. We are bound to God in Christ. Humanity and God are bound together. God differentiates between human and divine without any separation in Christ. The, resur the resurrected Jesus, who is the Lamb upon the throne, who sits at the right hand of God in an executive position, shows us that God continues in this loving relationship with the world, not in His glorious majesty and power, but He operates through the person of Jesus, through the dimension of love in His Son, that came to suffer in love for the sake of the world, that God continues to be open to suffer for the sake of the world in love. And so he doesn't rule as the king in majesty, just overruling and controlling everything, but he continues his commitment in love for the sake of the world. He operates through Jesus as the expression of his love in this very unique way. So God engages with the world in humility and loving vulnerability through the Son and His presence on earth through the Spirit because we read that Jesus gives His Spirit to the church and God is present in Jesus, in the Spirit, which brings us to this amazing thing that we are encountering the triune God in His glory as the God of love and commitment to his people. It's only when we understand that God is invested in our salvation, in himself completely, fully, that we do justice to how the Trinity functions. <laughs>